Hello, my name is Cheryl Fletcher Kuhn, and I've had the honor of being president for the Transparent Watercolor Society of America for the past two years. Today, we are here in Wisconsin at the Kenosha Public Museum, where the 45th annual TWSA exhibition is hung. Our jurors, Brenda Swenson and Mark Mahaffey, will be walking with our workshop attendees through the gallery. Join us. Hi, folks. My name is Mark Mahaffey, and I am a painter. And I say it that way because I use what I need to use to create the statements that I need to make with my work. Um, that often includes transparent watercolor, and it often does not. I've been painting since I was 10 years old, and that's a lot of years of painting. And my definition of what I consider to be valid and um, good is very broad, um, extremely broad, and um, I include that in everything that I think about in terms of painting. Uh, one thing I will do is die with a brush in my hand. So um, I would like to say first that every painting in this year's TWSA show is a good painting, absolutely, positively. It's a wonderful collection of what's being done currently in transparent watercolor today in this country. Um, having said that, my only regret as I um, did the awards was that I didn't have more awards to give out. So let's address some of these, uh, especially award-winning paintings, and a few others as well. Um, Catherine O'Neill's painting, and I've appreciated her work for years, I love how she simplifies shape and creates drama with value contrast. And um, whether she's doing that with a brush or whether she's doing that by lifting and scrubbing, regardless of technique, her statement is always um, right on and I call it uh, secure. She is secure in the knowledge of what she wants to do. So this is Dean Mitchell's painting. Almost everybody I know is familiar with Dean's work. Uh, it speaks to some of the underserved in this country and the underreported in terms of what's going on uh, socially in this country. And I always appreciate Dean's take on that. He's stuck to his vision um, throughout his career. Uh, and his work is eminently recognizable, eminently collectible, and the content of his work always grabs the viewer. So I love the design of Peter, and I cannot pronounce his last name even though he's told me four or five times how to pronounce it. But I do love the design. He's using uh, old rusty parts of our country, bridges, to um, create his design. He has converging lines in a lot of his work that lead the viewer somewhere. And then when he gets you there, he always gives you uh, something to contemplate as part of that story wonderful textures that add to the visual excitement of his paintings. Ken Call has become a master at the content included in the visual countenance of people's faces. Um, uh, you can see the angst or the joy um, of the uh, figures in his work and always included in the context of where they live and what they're up to and um, I so appreciate his work.
Hi, my name is Brenda Swenson, and I'm delighted to be working with Mark Mahaffey to select the show for this year's TWSA exhibition. Uh, we're, as we do this gallery walk, we're going to choose a few to talk about, though, as you can tell through the catalog and through this walk, that every painting deserves more attention than we're able to give them. But uh, we're just going to stop along the way, and I'm going to introduce you to a few paintings that really caught my eye. First painting right here is by Kathy Simon McDonald. I love the way that she has handled the space. This large L shape that forms around this figure, the heavy texture that goes into the background, and then the smoothness of her skin is really a nice contrast with each other. The way that she is standing on this white line, I really like it. It anchors her into the scene. Um, we can all relate to being an artist, so it, it, there's like this instant um, attraction. Just beautifully handled. Um, the texture is really quite striking, the way that she's captured all the different textures that run through. Just really beautifully done. painting by Audrey Montgomery and it's called In Between. What I like about this painting is that it's like everyday objects that we see. Quite often we pass by things and think they're not art worthy. But when I look at this painting, all the different signage, the patience that she had to do the lettering is really uh, quite noteworthy. But looking at how she's designed this shape the way that sh the shadows are orchestrated, and for me, shadows are a major component of what excites me, not only in somebody's artwork, but the reason that I would paint something in the first place. So when I look at this, the interesting handling of the shadows, the way each little crate is anchored by that shadow, the space around it supports the subject matter. This is a nice calm in what can be a very busy painting very striking and well presented too. It, the frame doesn't take away from it, very nicely done. So we have this very sensitive painting by Susan Horton I did get to talk to her a bit, and I was t uh, talking to another person about this painting, and, and Susan was listening uh, earlier this week, and I had indicated that the content of this piece, and when I look at paintings, I, I look principally at three things, the concept and content of the painting, the idea behind the painting, the emotional connection that the viewer gets with the audience. That's the first criteria that I look at. And then after that, after that comes the design, how the person put the painting together and how this structure leads the viewer's eye to the figure. And then we have the figure which, um, and the warm dominance and the figure in contemplation adds to the emotional content of this. After those two thoughts, criteria, the content of the piece and the design of the piece, separated by quite a bit, comes technique. And I think as painters sometimes we have a tendency to focus on how we apply paint instead of why we apply paint. And um, I, I got a chance to speak to this artist and she was more involved when the thought and the mood of this painting than she was application. And of course, the application was um, meticulous and, and wonderful.
So this is an award-winning painting by Lennox Wallace, and when you talk about emotional content of the piece, this painting has it and has a lot of it. We're, we're all coming off about a year and a half of COVID-19 pandemic, and everybody was fearful, anxious, still are really, um, and hopefully seeing the light of the end of that, hopefully, and this painting speaks so much about that. I appreciated the staggered effect, almost like we're viewing 20 seconds in time. And of course, a hospital situation and um, so many of our friends and relatives and acquaintances um, have been there. So a very powerful piece, well done with um, content. So I'd like to talk about this painting by Christine Ruchow. Um, she did get an award for this painting. Again, I got emotionally involved, intellectually involved in this painting. So I'm looking for that, especially as I view lots of paintings. There are paintings that seem to grab me. Um, it could be an emotional reaction, an intellectual reaction, a visceral reaction, um, but I want to be involved in that process, the thought, the idea behind the painting. And um, with all kinds of environmental issues on the planet and weather change, um, no matter what you think about the politics of that, Christine's painting and the title, Future in Balance, reminded me that we need to keep that aware. Her um, impeccable technique forces the viewer, if you will, to think about the title of this painting. This painting is by R. Mike Nichols called Springtime in Salinas. I enjoy his work. Um, he, I can't even say it's a little tongue in cheek. He's very straightforward on what he's wanting to say. Um, we can not jump too deep into politics here, but the way that he plays with the figures floating something is always a little askew. You've got this Easter bunny down here, you've got this cat. And there's a playfulness to his paintings that I think sometimes people don't look into the deeper story of what's going on. If you even look at the old Dutch paintings, there was a lot of symbolism about somebody was looking in the window or if there was a bird flying in. In a way, think of this painting in that way. There is all of this symbolism that's happening, the different birds that are the black bird, the white bird happening here, the way that he's using different types of breaking up of areas with patterns happening. There's, there's a tremendous amount of storytelling. It's exquisitely painted. He handles watercolor beautifully. I enjoy his sense of humor and the way that he can um, get a point across without it being too sharp, but he makes you think about it. Beautiful painting. Come down the wall here. So as I was looking at that painting by R. Mike Nichols, and he was being very clear and symbolic about things that had happened in this last year and a half. I come down to this painting, and I'm gonna to step to the other side. This painting is by Bev Joswick, and it's called Lost Time Is Never Found. There is a, there's a lot of symbolism in this painting, just like there was with R. Mike Nichols, but this is a little more subtle. When she's talking about time, you look at the different gears of the clock, I believe this is her daughter. And you start to look and you see underneath here, 2020. And then you see time. 
and this is really what I feel is about this last year, this year that we lost, and how we, we've handled that time, whether we've fretted it away, whether we've been contemplative about this time, whether we've used it wisely. Um, lost time is never found, but how we use it during these times of lockdown and pandemic really say a lot about us as people. So very thoughtful piece, looking at this blue turquoise that moves through and the stripes of orange on her dress is just has a strong dynamic feel. You've got all this curvilinear shapes happening and then these lines, the contrast between the two are very, very strong. Um, your eye is pulled in, you don't get stuck back in here, but you move up into the figure. Simplified corners, the eye knows where you're supposed to be looking. Really um, a thoughtful and a piece that I could spend a lot of time looking at. So I wanted to talk about this painting by Ruth Armitage. Um, I know Ruth personally, and I know part of her journey. She's worked very hard over the years. This painting is a bit of an outlier in this particular exhibit in that not only is it highly saturated transparent watercolor, it is a non-objective painting. And the title is House Divided, and you can see her division of space. If you look closely, it is an abstraction of that house divided, there's the house. If you didn't know the title, it would be a non-objective painting with a wonderful warm dominance, and then Ruth goes across the color wheel with blue and blue-green as a counter to that red and red-orange. It's a very striking painting, highly saturated, difficult to pull off that kind of construction, um, and she did a marvelous job. I wish that there were more non-objective paintings entered, um, something for the viewer to think about for next year. I wanted to talk about this painting um, by Fred Graff. Um, Fred, congratulations to you. Fred is this year's only Distinguished Master Awardee for the Transparent Watercolor Society of America. Um, he has been working like a lot of us his entire life, and we got to see the transition through the years of his painting. This is a marvelous example of design. Fred took the world as he saw it, internalized it, and then gave it back to us with this marvelous design of lights and darks as it goes across this paper. I love his use of white paper. It becomes an integral part of the composition. And his technique reinforced his design. So all of these washes are linked together, and it is a dance from one side of the painting to the other. Fred? Congratulations. This painting is by David Becker and is called Superheroes Number no. Two. Three pieces in a row that have really talked about the last 16 months that we've been living through. 
the hospital rooms, the masks. This has become a part of our er everyday life, what we're seeing. And often what you'll see is people think, well, I just want to do a pretty picture. I don't want to paint something that might not reflect a nicer time in life. Maybe I'm worried about sales and I want things to be beautiful. But as painters, uh, we are people that are representing our world right now. And you cannot go through this period without painting what we are living in. This is, this is a part of our history. And the way that this is handled, what it's telling about our life, it's, I feel it's a very important piece to me. I love the way that it is designed, the breaking down even the, the cubes of shapes within here, and then the eye moves over to this side, and we don't really know what they're looking at. But we've lived in this long enough that we can believe that this is somebody that's in dire distress because of COVID, and those who are there to kind of bring us back from that dark side. Um, beautiful painting. Five pieces in a row I've picked. Can you tell that I'm very influenced by what's happened in this pandemic? It has touched me greatly. This painting is by Tuva Stevens and is called Phantom COVID Number no. Two. She normally paints portraits of people that we see on the fringes of society, and she paints them in a way that we get to see them with fresh eyes and a closeness. This is a different painting for Tuva. And it's beautiful, it's thought-provoking. Love what I'm seeing here with the phantom of COVID being painted, the reflection in the glass as you're looking through, and him looking back over his shoulder, almost cynical, you know, half laughing, you know, that he is in control of what is happening. He's, he's the musician, he's the one that's orchestrating this music and in control at this time of COVID. Very, very thought provoking, um, so unusual for her, which is I think a reason that I'm so incredibly drawn. Handled beautifully, but it makes you stay a little bit longer and think what is more to this story. Um, very nice painting. This painting is by Mary Jansen and is called Challenging Brood. I love reflective light in color. And this to me is just a magical handling of it. The small delicate lace, the shifts of color that go through that lace, the subtle glow that happens beneath, the soft shadows that wrap around, also a very limited palette of color. So the shadows go into mostly blues and this yellow. The bird is striking. The colors are similar to what is happening around it. Often I will see students think that one more color will save a painting. This is a perfect example of that, you know, color gets all the glory, but when you look at this, it is value. It is beautifully orchestrated, delicate and lovely all the way through. Next is a painting award winner by Chris Kropensky, and it's called Red. 
when you look at between the two paintings, the way that she has handled the big, bold line, she is so well known for her fabric, the way that she uses it to orchestrate through a painting. She is, the way she handles color is brilliant. The edges, the folds of the fabric, look at this large shape down here in the foreground and how back in here the shapes get smaller and smaller as they go back. The division of space, look at, even though there's a lot of fabric, there's not a lot besides ha happening on that fabric. In a way, it's, it's a busy, but it almost feels like water, the way that your eye moves on the lines going back. Lovely distortion and handling here of the glass. Very nicely done. Uh, her artwork is so recognizable, beautiful, transparent, just, it just glows. I want to show in contrast where you'd seen the bird down there just a minute ago, and this is Monica Pete, Antiques and Lace. The first one down there with the birds had a whole bunch of lace that covered all the area, but you look at this one and look at the simplification. The lace just goes right through here, and it's stunning. You know, it's the quiet on this side, all of this negative painting to catch the lace as it moves through, the beautiful reflections and glow that happens. Um, oh, she makes watercolor just absolutely glow. Her, her contrast of lights and darks, the bold against the soft is a beautiful contrast, just a, a stunning painting. This is a wonderful painting by Alicia Shea. And when I saw this painting, of course, when Brenda Swenson and I uh, uh, jury for selection, I talked to her about it. Hours and hours and more hours were spent because there were many, many um, entries and not enough space for some paintings that did not get in. Every time I saw this painting, it brought a smile to my face. So the title is Closed on Thursday. And I don't know what a, a lot of us, my friends, myself, are approaching the age where we're kept alive by the pills that we take. Or they enhance our life as it is, as opposed to being kept alive. And so who has not been here? Um, yes, I have a pill carrier in my hotel room, and um, it's not closed on Thursday. So, Again, the, the content of this piece grabbed me. It was uh, humorous content, the way I viewed it, and um, I think the artist would be happy with the viewer being grabbed. So this is L series number three by John Salmonen, and I appreciate the fact that he stayed within his ideal subject matter. It is essentially an urban scene, greatly pulled apart, distorted, and put back together again. Um, John has a fabulous sense of design. We see the, that with every painting that he does. I did appreciate that this was not a representational painting. Um, I've been in Chicago enough to um, appreciate the design elements possible with the elevated train, and John's a lot closer, and I'm sure 
as he looked up and at the street of the L in Chicago, he also appreciated the design possibilities. And the structure of this piece from light in this lower corner and then the lights leading us through the painting, I thought he did a marvelous job. Also, he pushed back areas of the painting to make them quite subtle, which brought forward the areas of the painting that he chose. Um, a nice job. So a beautiful painting by Stephen Zong. Um, and this painting is about energy and mark making and movement. A marvelous example of getting the viewer to almost want to dance, almost. Certainly, the artist appreciated the movement of this dancer. You can see blurred edges. You can see many touches to the paper, which made perfect sense. Technique matching content. Um, absolutely a marvelous piece. I can hear the dancer's dress moving. Beautiful painting by Dong Feng Li. Plateau dancer. I heard the story of this painting as he traveled throughout China and up into Tibet. Um, like the rest of the planet, a lot of um, ethnic dress is being dropped in favor of uh, Western wear, blue jeans a lot of the time. And um, Dong Feng waited until festival time to take reference photos of the marvelous wedding dress of the uh, indigenous people on the plateau of Tibet. What I really liked about this painting was twofold. One, marvelous patterns, well handled, um, to the point of wonderful obsessiveness. And then beautiful skin tones and lighting that actually featured more blue, cool, than warm. And it just gives the viewer an idea of what color and value can do um, regardless of the local color of the piece. Um, and I thought that the wrinkles and the sensitive uh, handling of the faces and the lighting on the faces specifically really drew me into this piece. And um, this painting, uh, well-deserved of the top award for TWSA. I just think this is a perfect painting to end our tour on because it is the Sky Ledge Award winner. Um, I agree with everything that Mark said, just truly um, a very gorgeous painting. Everything from the very large shapes to the fine wisps of, of hair there's, there's not this element of trying to over-beautify the women, but showing them that through their age and through tradition, the wrinkles and beauty that exists in their face from the life that they've lived. I think this is a perfect painting for us to kind of end up our walk through on because it is the top award winner. This was just my painting called Kettles and Cups. Transparent watercolor, a lot of glazing and negative painting. Um, it's a little bit different in color for me, but I felt it truly represented what transparent watercolor does beautifully, the underpainting, the underlying glow that exists, and the suggestion of negative shapes. So this is waiting number eight. It is eight in a long series of large transparent watercolors. And I specifically chose transparent watercolor for this series, which not too many people have seen really. It's a series that speaks to um, waiting 
waiting for possibilities. Um, a lot of them are exotic food waiting to be eaten. And they all address um, some of the problems that as we see uh, population growth and increase on the planet and what can happen with that. This specific painting, the killdeer eggs bathed in this early morning light never did hatch. Um, they were in jeopardy from the start. I captured this particular moment um, and the next time I walked by this place, the killdeer eggs were in tatters. Um, not sure why, but hence the title waiting. Um, and waiting can have positive or negative connotations. Um, in this particular painting, even though um, the sunlight is positive force, um, sometimes bad things happen. So uh, the content of this piece is what drew me in initially. And then I got a little obsessive with the gravel, but we can be obsessive at times. <laughs> so it was a fun painting. Thank you for joining us. The Kenosha Public Museum and the Transparent Watercolor Society of America are extremely proud to continue to bring excellence in watercolor annually in live and in person. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next year.